Welcome, everybody, to The Week That Was. I'm your host, Saeed Khan, and you're going to get two shows for the price of one today. It is also the year that was. Uh, for those of you who are uh, or did celebrate uh, Festivus yesterday, I hope that the uh, feats of strength haven't tired you out too much. And I know that you're looking to uh, put away the aluminum pole, but before you do that, please tune in for our show today because we're going to make it really impactful. We're going to talk about many issues of the year that was, a year in review show, with an excellent panel as always. Uh, joining us today, we have uh, Alexis Wiley, uh, former chief of staff to Mayor Mike Duggan, currently running Moment Strategy, which is a public relations and strategic consulting firm. Welcome, Alexis. Thank you so much. We also have uh, regulars, uh, attorney Steve Fishman. How you doing, Fish? Wonderful. It's a and, pleasure to be here. And we have intrepid investigative journalist and former candidate for uh, a local election, ML Elric. Still working for food, folks. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we have our maestro, the editor of Deadline Detroit, Alan Langle. Hello. Hello. So let's go ahead and start with what was the local news story of the year? 2021, can you believe it, is nearly over, but we have been chock full of uh, local news. So anyone who wants to chime in. I defer to my former colleague. No, no, I'll really go first. Her. Alaric, you're going to say something way funnier than me. So you, you, you no, no, I, I'm going to be the predictable guy. Um, All right, go, go for I'm, it. I'm going to say public corruption. For 20 years, we've had a problem in this city of local officials betraying the people they swore to serve. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, Barbara Quaid, who is now a law professor and media star, declared an end to the culture of corruption in Detroit with the Kwame Kilpatrick prosecution. Now we've had four city council members under the specter of a federal investigation, one of whom has uh, been very well represented and pleaded guilty to misconduct in office yeah. after being charged with bribery. Another one admitted to bribery. He was a pastor and a disaster, and now we don't know where he's headed, but I think it's going to be once again on the public tit, uh, and he'll be wearing pinstripes, but not the kind that come with a bow tie. And then we got two more who may be charged, who may not be charged. And according to my sources, there's at least one other council member who may get out of office before charges fall on them. And this is this is not the direction we want to be headed in as we try and build the new Detroit. But it seems like the story of this year is the story of the last 20 years. And it's uh, it's heartbreaking. Do you see any changes happening with that, ML? Well, I saw one chance to change it, but that didn't happen. So, no, I don't think so. <laughs> well, you know, I never really thought about it this way, but seersucker suits, Yankee home uniforms and prison stripes all have something alarmingly in common. Yeah, well, there'll be some more yanking going on. <laughs> Once the prison stripes come on, but uh, this is a sophisticated show, so I want to end the year on a high note. <laughs> oh, oh you're, I think you might be a bit delusion there, uh, delusional there, mate. But okay, thank you for the compliment, Alexis. You know, honestly, I think the biggest local story was to me the one story that I think has united all of us, which was how in the world are we navigating COVID? I mean, I think that that really that has so shaped everything we've done, everything. Um, just our, our daily lives, um, even just thinking from how virtual has become the new norm and figuring out what do, what do our lives look like from how do you get childcare? How do you make sure that you're, um, you know, fulfilling, having a, a, a difference between, you know, the home and work responsibilities and really having life balance? Like, I, I think that's been the, the one story that I think we just we all wish we could get past, but clearly it just is the gift that keeps on giving. So it's interesting because you mention it as being the shared experience, which it is, uh, an opportunity for a lot of us to gain common ground. Yet at the same time, I mean, we have to acknowledge that it's also been one of the most divisive uh, experiences, mm -hmm. uh, particularly along uh, political and cultural lines. Absolutely. And I think even in political, cultural, but also class, right? Your experience in this pandemic has been very different depending on whether you are someone who is stocking shelves at a grocery store or if you are a corporate lawyer or somebody who's working a, a, a white collar job. It's been very different. And I think it has, has even um, further divided us along class lines simply because of just the lived experiences of it. 
Well, one of the things is just access to the internet. I mean, I think, as you said, having the ability, uh, almost the presumption uh, for people to have access to not only the internet, but also to uh, platforms like this, uh, StreamYard or Zoom or Teams uh, by which to uh, conduct business or classes um, is, is not something that's available to everybody. And I suppose we can dovetail that into uh, the, um, the infrastructure bill and uh, the idea about uh, broadening uh, Wi-Fi. Alan, what do you think? I, yeah, I, you know what, I, 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 talking about the whole COVID thing, I th the thing that kind of bothers me is how the governor has changed so so much over time. And in the beginning, she was such a, a leader there. I'm, I'm not suggesting that she shut down businesses, but we're seeing businesses shut down on their own. We're seeing a lot of restaurants uh, in Detroit shut down because people are getting staff people are getting COVID. So I think that is going to take care of itself. What I'd like to see is I, I just think to, to issue an advisory to wear masks, if you believe that masks make a difference, which the governor does, I don't know why she has issued just an advisory where I go places where the majority of people are not wearing masks. And it's not that much to ask people to have a mandatory mask. And at least, look, you're going to have some places where somebody's going to say, screw that, I'm not wearing a mask. And OK, well, two out of 10, one out of 10 people are not going to wear it instead of eight out of 10 now not wearing the mask or, you know, or at least 50, 60 percent. Um, I just think and, and I don't know how that's going to be played out. I mean, I don't think like if. if James Craig becomes a candidate. I don't think he can play around a lot with that because the Republican uh, mantra is freedom, you know, do your thing, do what you think is right, as opposed to do what's right for the good of everyone. But I'd like to see the governor be a little bit more forceful. Has she just simply been cowed into silence? I have kind of the same feeling, I think, that, that everybody is saying, but I think people have and this is just based on the people I talked to. I had an astounding conversation with a friend of mine who's a well-educated Jewish guy. I, to me, every Jew I know is vaccinated, every single one yeah. that I know. And this guy and his brother, and he's giving me this whole split, and I'm listening to him on the phone, and I'm thinking, is this the same guy that I've known for 30 years? I can't believe that that's the same person. I, I think that what you guys are saying, it, it, Alan, I, I don't think advisories or the governor – Unless you had a pistol in people's heads and made them put a mask on, they ain't doing it. That's just the way it's going to be. And it's broken down over time into whatever other, whether it's politics, whether it's this attitude of, you know, it's interesting the Republicans love freedom until it comes to a woman's freedom of choice. You know, freedom's a big deal for them, you know, as long as it has to wearing a mask in the Kroger store, for God's sake. Um, but I, I, I really can't answer the stuff that's that, that's political. I wait to hear from Elric and Alexis about the politics well, of it because even, experts that. even even in the business sector, I, I can tell you a week ago when I went to the New York Bagel Factory on uh, on Woodward and Ferndale, out of nine people in line last week, two were wearing masks. I was one of them. Now since then, when I was there yesterday. Uh, they had a sign on the door that said, we, we suggest, uh, you know, that our customers wear the mask. And then it was sort of flipped. And there were about of like 10 people in line, only two were not wearing masks. And so, I mean, even if, if the stores uh, and the businesses would, would go along with it and say, we suggest. And, you know, there's always going to be a couple of schmucks who just say, I don't believe in that. Screw don't you. Don't say schmucks. Alexis doesn't like that word. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> Putzes, they're yeah. putzes. Uh, I, I, I think I think it's also incumbent upon businesses for customers to be careful uh, to to make them comfortable. And if you put at least at minimum a sign on the door that says we suggest our customers wear. I go into the chiropractor last week. There's a sign on the door. You have to wear a mask. Nobody's nobody's bitching about it. It's it's. But people need to have, and I mean, ideally, the state, the state, or the city of Detroit, or the different cities would would give out little signs that uh, placards or whatever that businesses could put on the door that says, you know, the city of Detroit uh, recommends masks or whatever. But I, I put a sign in the elevator. I put a article, a New York Times article about the advisory, the mask advisory. I put it up saying that you know Michigan uh, suggests wearing uh you know is issued an advisory and 
I assume the management took it down after a couple of days. So. You know what, though, to, to jump in on this, I think the reason why the governor's not doing this mm-hmm. is because at this point, people aren't listening. Right. People aren't here for it. Everybody is doing whatever they think is appropriate for them. You got the vaccines out there. People are making personal choices. I just think in Michigan right now, there's no appetite for it. And people, and now I I do think we're at a moment where there's so many more, this Omicron is starting to scare people, which is why I think you saw that flip of now eight people in line had their mask on. But I think right now the feeling around government is like, look, you, you do your best. You tell people to get vaccinated. You tell them to wear their mask. And then at the end of the day, you're gonna do it or you're not. In 2020, where there were no vaccines available, um, you couldn't, you, you know, we were all equally vulnerable. I think right now we're just at a spot where we're like, I think people are just saying, look, either, you know, if you wanna be healthy, wear the mask, do the right thing, get vaccinated, now get boosted. You're assuming that risk is only your risk. When you go to the hospitals now, there are no. people, I had a friend who considerably <laughs> older than me, who I used to work with the Detroit News, he fell, he broke some vertebrae in his neck. He had to wait hours to get a bed because the hospitals are over flooded. So it's not, it's, it's almost as if I'm saying, don't tell me how much I can drink and then I can't drive. That's me on me. That's what I, I feel the, the drinking and driving thing is somewhat similar. It's like, yeah. I don't tell me I have the freedom. I can drink as much as I want. And then if I want to drive home, that's my, I'm taking a risk. Well, your risk is bigger than you. I, I agree with you. I, and I, and I, I understand where you're coming from. I just think right now the reality is there's just so little of an appetite for the, the Michigan public for anything that is, is more um, restrictive, at least in, in, in my opinion. Uh, well, that's I, why we're doing so horrible. That's why our numbers are horrible. Our hospitals are, are filled up. Uh, you know, we haven't gotten to the point where we're getting refrigerated trucks again outside hospitals, but... Right. Who knows with the Omicron? I, I know it's not supposed to be as severe, but. The problem is this battle was lost a long time ago. And I don't think Whitmer was cowed. I think she was elephanted into backing <laughs> off on this because she knows what the right thing to do is. But I just spent 10 days in Costa Rica, a second world country, and everybody's wearing a mask. And nobody's beefing about it. Nobody's bitching about it. And there's one reason why. Because El Presidente in Costa Rica is not named <laughs> Donald John Trump. And because these battle lines were set two years ago, and one of the reasons why a lot of folks in Detroit aren't getting vaccinated is because a lot of black folks, for good reason, don't trust the government. I'm not talking about our current government, but because the federal government has betrayed the people of this country repeatedly, particularly underserved and underprivileged communities. So we can't overcome decades of mistrust. And then we have the leader of the free world basically saying, Go ahead and shoot kids, don't wear masks, and deny the truth. And we're trying to get people to listen to simple things like put a mask on. You know, masks are not a big deal. And as a reporter who's dealt with a lot of politicians, I wish they'd wear masks all the time because there's a lot of people who smoke and drink coffee and never heard the word Altoid in their whole damn life. Just keep these masks going. Well, you know, when I was in London last week, they, um, I mean, first of all, they have National Health Service. And so people were queuing up to get uh, vaccinated, to get boosted, and to get tested. And part of it was that the government dangled in front of them that uh, if you don't do this, no Christmas parties, uh, uh, no going Unless to the pub. The prime minister. Special. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Um, everyone say a little prayer for uh, Boris Johnson uh, because, uh, and if anybody's looking to hire, he might need a job soon. Uh, but uh, the fact that <laughs> the fact that uh, there was a kind of a mobilization and an uptick because Omicron was really spreading uh, shows that there is still um, a public will that can uh, that can be deployed and can be triggered. Steve, uh, I didn't want to miss out on on you as far as your local uh, story for the year. Well, obviously, we've been talking about the serious things from the local story, but just to throw a little sports into it, I thought the sports story of the year was the University of Michigan and, and Michigan State's football teams, to tell you the truth, two teams that nobody thought was going to do anything, and they brought a lot of excitement. In the middle of all of this angst that everybody is legitimately suffering, doesn't rank anywhere near, obviously, uh, the serious issues that we're talking about. But I, I thought that was the story of the year from, from the sports standpoint. I did want to comment on, on ML's thing. I think 
that he's absolutely right. Uh, I, I think the focus ought to stay on uh, public corruption in this town. The only thing I always ask, and he and I have had more than a few conversations about it, when it comes to the individual potential targets, let's not leap to conclusions before the facts come out. The one person that uh, he did mention, we're not mentioning people's names, but he mentioned that some lawyer was involved in it. Uh, there was a lot of clients and talking about the things that the guy supposedly did. And the truth of the matter is that the way in which it turned out was actually what he did do. The rest of it was horseshit. Uh, I think you're going to find that at least with respect to one of the potential targets that ML was talking about, it's going to be even worse horseshit. But I'm not talking about it right now because we're not at that point yet. And it's very difficult, not just for the press, but for the public as well, to not accept the fact that just because someone's name's in the newspaper and because somebody from the FBI talks out of school and says blah, 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 that that means that there's actually something there. So yes, I believe it's something we gotta, you have to always be conscious of. Yes, I certainly believe, and I certainly wish that people would quit trying to line their own pockets uh, if they wanna run for office. There's plenty of places to work where you can make as much dough as you want. Nobody cares. Become a better athlete, and you can play in the NBA and make $12 million a year. Uh, I, I, I agree that you have to keep focused on that, and I think part of it, you know, it's, it's it, if you don't mind me, just a quick tangent, we don't blame the public enough. We don't blame human beings enough anymore. You know, when I grew up, when you had a naval officer for a father and the parents lived through a depression, you know, they expected us to do the right thing. Uh, the public has the opportunity in every election, and I know Mr. Elric agrees with me 100%, to do something about this stuff. And if you don't, if you allow not just corruption to go on in the city of Detroit, but if you allow Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boebert to become uh. United States representatives, look in the mirror and say shame on you to yourself. So that's just a little aside. I think the public comes in for not enough criticism, and they need to be criticized more. Apparently, Marjorie Taylor Greene, the anti-vaxxer queen, sorry, I didn't mean to rhyme, it just happened. Uh, uh, she uh, owns stock in at least more than one of the vaccine companies, so there oh, you wow. go. Wow. I'm shocked. I'm, are you shocked to hear that? I'm just shocked. I'm I shocked the only shot she's taken her with an AK-47, but uh, that's fine. I would say I, I think uh, the Oxford shooting was just... Uh, a huge thing here locally and I mean it resonated nationally and it's just an issue that's recurring and we're going to see it play out again in 2022. Uh, I mean the biggest the biggest crime is that nothing is done after one after another. I mean maybe security improves in in Oxford High School uh, in some, you know, in the school district, but and maybe some other school districts uh, he heed the warning. But the society-wise, NRA-wise, whatever, it's it's nothing is being done, and I think that's just really criminal. But I think that story is going to spill over. It's certainly going to bleed over into 2022. It's going to be a big one. And I thought the other one, the big story, it was it was not, it didn't have a lot of legs beyond a, a certain. Period, but the Kwame Kilpatrick uh, getting out of prison after getting a 28-year prison sentence. I think with with all the calculations of whatever they call a good time in the federal system or whatever, he would have served maybe 24 had he served the whole time. But which is, I, I think, I, I first of all, I, I'm of the belief that the the 28-year sentence was just absurd. I mean, having and, and I know Steve is you know been in the federal system for a long time, uh, and I don't know if he wants to weigh in on it, but uh, the 28-year sentence was just ridiculous. And so I think it almost gave the opening for for the justification to release Kwame early. Uh, but and, and, and Elric, I'm sure, has a an opinion on that. Uh, so... <laughs> Not anymore, brother! <laughs> I, I, I would say... Years, I will be done. Yeah. I... I I think that most people involved in the federal system, I'd say almost everybody believed that that sentence was too high. And in fact, the the irony of him being released by a career criminal <laughs> right. was not lost on me, let's put it that way. But I, I think he served, I can't remember, how long was he locked up? Eight years, something like that? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if the sentence was 15, he'd have probably done 11 or 12, which probably would have been a 
more appropriate sentence. But there were a lot of things going on then. I mean, there was a great judge that presided over that case, and the government chose to seek that kind of time because of that guy from Indiana, I think it was, who was a public official. Ohio. It was Cuyahoga oh. County. Uh, yeah, Cleveland. and he got like, he got yeah. the same thing. And he I got think twenty eight years. I, right. I think everybody likes to talk that the judge was too tough. You know, the government asked for that, and they had to know when they were asking for it that no one was dead and nobody. You know, the the, the crime was bad. But 15 years is a big, big, big time sentence. In federal but, the, court. but but I think it's up to the judge to also to sort of temper the prosecutorial uh, requests. Uh, sometimes they're, I mean, it, it was based on guidelines. So they they saw it as justification. It was based on a precedent that the guy in Cuyahoga County got 28 years. Another guy in that same case got 21 years, which was very similar to what Bobby Ferguson and uh also also got but and, and he also ended up uh you know there were, it, it was interesting there were there were a lot of people talking about uh kwame's 20-year sentence but very few people talked about bobby ferguson's 21 years and i don't know if it was that you people know why? you want to know why yeah i i have some theories but go ahead what do you think well be, be, before you're too critical of the judge that's the same judge that released bobby ferguson and if you read her opinion Right. which is exactly what I told a couple of people from the media, from the news and the free press. Before you start blasting anybody, go read the opinion. When they read the opinion, they quoted from the opinion, and she was absolutely right to do what she did. No, so, no, absolutely. No, it was absolutely right to let him him go because she had to, really. I mean, out of fairness, out of fairness there. But I, I was saying that why people weren't outraged when, when Bobby Ferguson got 21 years is some people thought he was a bad guy. He was a thug who had gotten away with too much. Stories about the pistol whipping and stuff like that. Yeah. The pistol whipping of an employee, uh, Mm -hmm. some uh, bullying of, of some police officers over some violations of property violations or whatever. Uh, So there was very little uh, in, in ML, you can correct me if I'm wrong. It seemed like there was very little, uh, concern as compared to Kwame's sense. So he, we'll stick it to the big thing that everybody's wrong on here. The, uh, the administration of the sentence had nothing to do with justice. It had nothing to do with over sentencing. It had everything to do with local billionaires who support a billionaire president going to the billionaire president and saying, Hey boss, let my pal out of prison. That's what happened. So, you know, we can debate the merits of it. We can debate sentencing guidelines. We can debate Jimmy DeMora in Cuyahoga County. We can debate all these things. But really what it comes down to is race and class and the way that people don't want to talk about it. White billionaires ask a white billionaire for a favor, and they got it. And that's but, an but, but that's, uh, you know what, that may be part of it, but it's an oversimplification. That's the big there, part of it. But, okay, there's, there's a part of it, but there's an oversimplification. It's a 99% there, that no, 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 I, I think there were other. I was giving you a point nine because it's Christmas <laughs> and Hanukkah. Thank you. Um, I think there were there were other people involved in in that, but it, you know, there's certainly look every every release is is political, and and I, you know, I to tell you the truth, when I spoke to uh, Kwame, he said, you know what. Your, I wrote a column saying that 28 years was too much, and I and I laid it out why I, I thought it was that. I can't believe and, it. Yeah, yeah. Are you shocked? But he told me that yeah, that column. But oh. he, he he told me that that column uh, circulated in the White House and that it had an impact on that. So I can I can cl- I can say I'm not a billionaire. <laughs> I can but you played a part. I always tell the truth. I'm sorry. I, I I have to vote with ML there. The, we're talking about a career criminal that let the guy go. You, you know he either got paid, he didn't do it because he never does anything because he thinks it's right because he doesn't know what's right. So I if, if I didn't know what ML just said, but that sounds like something to me. What you guys were asking me about was what did I think of the sentence to begin with and what did I think of Bobby Ferguson being released. Once that career criminal did what he did with Kwame, the judge, I'm sure, thought to herself, I don't necessarily agree with him getting out so early, but I'm certainly not going to make the other guy who doesn't have that kind of dough now that ML tells me what uh, 
what probably went on. I'm not going to make him sit there for 21 year sentence when the career criminals let the other guy out. Right. And uh, yeah, I mean, right. to pretend that 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 career criminal ever does anything for any good, righteous reasons, that to me is as naive as you can be. The man has been a criminal since he was a kid. He's a criminal today and he'll be one till he dies. And if, when you're telling me people, billionaires went to him, uh, and he's no billionaire, by the way, in my opinion, at least, but he, they, they, I, it wouldn't surprise me in the least if they stuck some dough in his pocket. I mean, that's the only way he's ever known to do things. Or, so. or politically, he was told that. Or, or he figured he'd get some people angry. You know, I mean, look, Bar McQuaid was, you know, is on MSNBC trashing him all the time. And it's like, oh, Barb McQuaid was involved in that case. Well, probably a, a multitude of elements, including politics, behind the scenes politics. And we can't, we can't forget, though, I think State Rep Karen Witz, that played a role. Um, yeah. And you know, I've had plenty of conversations with her talking about how she, you know, had conversations within the White House about this. And she did have White House access. Totally know that's true. So I, I think that she was in the mix. And there there were a lot of people who were trying. I mean, they tried this with Obama and he didn't do it. And, you know, now I think that they figured they they had an end with, with Trump and, and they were right. And he's he's out and he's living, you know, his life. He has. My understanding is he has no interest in, and, and I think he communicated that in your column, Alan, like he's not interested in coming back in Detroit. He wants to focus on his life, building a ministry. Um, and I, you know, I think give him an opportunity to, to um, actually inspire people to do something good. Look at all the people that Trump pardoned. Uh, that's that's our know, point. That's Bannon, what Bannon, yeah, I mean, he's, the only yeah. one who didn't get it was the Tiger King guy. He's shocked. Well, I mean, that, that kind of segues into, I mean, what I would think is uh, another important local story of the year. I mean, going all the way back and one that bled in from 2020. And that was uh, our Michigan legislature's uh, Republican leadership getting wooed by, uh, by Trump uh, to try to help uh, uh, subvert the election here. And uh, we find that that, uh, that climate still exists and uh, efforts are underway still to try to disenfranchise voters and uh, try to game the system. So uh, wait and see on that. Steve, I had one question for you um, as we were talking about prison sentences. Uh, the 110 year sentence that was uh, given to a uh, truck driver in Colorado uh, for apparently uh, um, uh, being involved in an accident that caused uh, the death of four uh, people in other cars, uh, excessive? I have to tell you, I don't know anything about this. Okay. Uh, was it a state? It was a state court case. Uh, it was yeah. apparently a uh, uh, truck. Uh, the brakes failed. Uh, there, there doesn't seem to be a question about that. But the prosecutor said that uh, the truck driver knew that the brakes were shoddy and that also he had an uh, opportunity to avoid by going into one of those off ramps, uh, chose not to do so. And the judge says that um, uh, he was uh, bound to because of minimum sentencing. Uh, sentence him not only to the number of years, but for the sentences to run consecutively, not concurrently. Uh, ML, I think you were nodding your head about that. Are you familiar with it? Yeah, I mean, the, the the judge said this is a this is a terrible sentence, but my hands are tied, and uh, and I think um, not knowing the intricate de details of the case, uh, I'm going to go with the judge. When a judge says I got to give you 110 years, and I don't want to. That tells us there's a problem. The other thing is a life sentence, 110 years. How old is this guy? Negative 30? <laughs> Come on. Ridiculous. Uh, was this By the way, the, the truck driver, uh, poor Hispanic man. Um, I, I wonder, I wonder if, if he had uh, an amazing dream team, Steve Fishman defense uh, team with him. If they would have said, yeah, give us the 110 years, but we're going to take this to the streets and we're going to take this to the Colorado Supreme Court. We're gonna, and maybe those things are all going to happen. But in this country, unless you can afford a fisherman, um, good luck because you're screwed. Yeah. Let, let, me, let me just you guys have piqued my interest, because I, in all honesty, I, I can't imagine a statutory scheme hmm. that would allow that would require a judge to give a sentence like that. I mean, we don't have anything even in the vicinity of that in the right. state of Michigan. Right. Either you're convicted. There's only three things you can be convicted of. There's a homicide. Well, there's a fourth, but three felonies. First degree murder, second degree murder, or some 
type of manslaughter, voluntary or involuntary. If it's manslaughter, it's a 15 year max. First degree murder, it's, it, it, it's there's no way this could fit first degree murder, the facts that you guys just told me. And second degree murder carries up to life, but it's a term of years and it's totally up to the judge. Now there are sentencing guidelines. The guidelines are not mandatory. If I'm going to look this case up when we're done with this. I, I think four people, are... was it four people who died in there and there were several injuries? So who, did they stack up each, uh, you know, first degree murder or whatever? I, I, I'm as... just telling you there's no such thing. In, in right. the Oxford case, there could be nothing worse than four children, you know, being killed in, in, in this case. And you cannot get, a, well, you could get 110 years, but it wouldn't be mandatory. If he's convicted of second degree, someone wants to give him 80 to 110 you could, but it sounds like if the judge was saying, I, I really think this is an outrageous sentence, but I have no choice. I got to look this one up. And I, I wouldn't be shocked if you end up seeing ACLU or somebody get in, involved in that. However, with that said, I think that when you, these trucks, I mean, on the road, they are, I mean, it, it is a weapon, right? Like they're the damage they can do when you have a driver who decides to ignore that the brakes aren't working. And he probably had a lot of different different factors of like, I mean, these these truckers are, are working under really terrible conditions under companies that don't necessarily care about their health and their well-being and also the well-being of the public. So we probably need to look at the overall system. But at the same time, when you make a decision like that and you've got a family that, you know, four people who are dead, I, I mean, it's terrible, but I mean... You killed you killed four people. Yeah, I think one of the one of the key points the prosecution brought up again. I only know what I've read is that there was a runout lane where basically when you're in the mountains, there'll be maybe a hundred feet of gravel that if you're in a truck and you lose control, you can just ditch. Yeah. And the the driver said that so the reason he didn't do that is because if he had swerved over, he would have killed other people for sure. And so he was just. I mean, it sounds like he was in a no-win situation. I'm, I'm kind of wondering why the owner of the trucking company isn't uh, facing some sort of charges, but perhaps that's that's yet to come. But yeah, we, we don't want to lose sight of the fact that four people lost their lives, and some of their some of their loved ones did testify that they wanted this guy to do major time. But uh, yeah, can, can, I, can I can I just Colorado jump in? Now. Justice right now, the Colorado District Attorney is asking the court to reconsider the 110 year prison sentence. Okay. And a status hearing is set for Monday morning. Uh, the first judicial district attorney filed a motion on Friday asking the court to reconsider his sentence and a second motion just a couple of days ago to expedite the process so it could be heard by the judge who presided over the case. So, and it, there's also a petition going to the governor that already has 4.7 million signatures asking the governor to do something about this. So I kind of think it was just what I thought. This is kind of odd. <laughs> That's That was just a 30-second review. And, and he's going to have his own Steve Fishman pretty soon. No, no. But actually, I, I I don't think he's going to need Steve Fishman. When the district attorney came, that's the prosecutor. The prosecutor <laughs> right. went before the judge and asked for Clowney's sentence to be reduced. It's pretty difficult for a judge to say, wait a minute, ain't you the same prosecutor who brought these charges? So well, well, let me ask you, the governor, I mean, the, the choices of a, a governor at that point, let's say the judge is stubborn and says, no, I have to do this. Uh, the, the, the governor can what? Just commute. The governor could could he, he could reduce the sentence through a commutation. It depends on what the rule. It depends on what the rule. This is what I'm saying. It's very difficult. You see these people getting on TV talking about they're from Minneapolis and they're talking about what the law is in Colorado. Every state's different here. Yes, the governor could commute the sentence. She could commute it to nothing or she could make it you know, 40 to 60 or whatever it is. Right. Not, we don't know what the law is in Colorado. Good. Interesting. Well, it seems as though there was an effort being made by truck drivers uh, who declared that they were going to boycott Colorado and just simply drive around it. So uh, that might have also had uh, some influence on uh, on changing uh, people's minds. By the way, if you're ever out in Utah, about an hour and a half uh, west of uh, Salt Lake City near the Bonneville Salt Flats, there is a rinky dink truck stop. Uh, none, none, none of these flying V's or flying J's that you see anywhere in Iowa, but they uh, they have the best Punjabi breakfast you could ever want <laughs> because a growing number of the uh, long distance trucking sector is actually uh, Sikh uh, Indian, especially in Canada. 
So, uh, like I said, if you want something other than an egg McPlastic, uh, it is uh, it doesn't disappoint. So, that'd be good if I'm driving to Utah for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's put it this way, ML: fly to Salt Lake and then just drive the hour and a half to uh, to where the truck stop is. You may have missed the point where I'm unemployed. <laughs> all right i'm an old man so i fly to the bathroom four times a night and that's the extent of my traveling now all right so details, before, details. Say, say before you before you change the subject just on the little bit i just looked at yep. my prediction is it will not be long it will not be long it's not going to be in the court of appeals or in the supreme court where that sentence for that truck driver is going to be changed and i don't think it's just because truckers are saying they're not coming to colorado i think that Wait, I 4.7 million signatures this quickly? That That's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing, yeah. All right, thanks Wait, for the I have a question, though. Fishman, like, what do you think, in, in with the circumstances that you know right now, <laughs> what would be a, an appropriate sentence for something like that? I don't really know very much about it, obviously, as I just told you. I would say that if you've got four dead people, um, you know, I could see a sentence of 25 to 50 or something. I don't know if they even have indeterminate sentencing there. In yeah. Michigan, we have indeterminate sentencing. In federal court, someone like Kwame got 28 years. That's a flat sentence. But I think yeah. a 25-year sentence, for, you know, for sure, would be. But I don't know the facts of it. If you know, when ML says, if the guy said, if, if he went to trial and he says, look, I had two choices, then it starts to sound more like manslaughter, even though there's four deaths. Yeah, and manslaughter is a 15-year max in, here in Michigan, and you can only get two thirds of the maximum as a minimum. So here, the worst you'd get. If we're manslaughter, we're 10 to 15. It, it, it's impossible to say, though, because I don't know the facts any more than I just read. No, I, I appreciate that, though, because I was just wondering what, what would be a typical sentence based on, like, the basic facts that we know. So it's interesting. Well, I think that consecutive sentences or, or yeah, everything's concurrent, right, Steve? It's all served at the same time. In, in, in Michigan, the only things that are what's consecutive is felony firearm is two years consecutive to whatever your regular sentence is. But when you have homicide, it, it, you know, in the the Oxford shooting, there'll be four counts of first degree murder, but they all run concurrent. Although, as ML says, it, it, at a point, it gets to be a little ridiculous anyway, right? It'll be like Richard Pryor used to say about a guy gets double life. What does that mean? If he dies and comes back, he's got to go directly to prison with <laughs> third grade? You know, so, yeah. anyway. Now, if, in federal court, the, there's consecutive uh, sentences. For certain things. But, but most of the time when you have plea deals, the plea the, right now the only mandatory consecutive things, well, I'm not going to get into too many, uh, aggravated identity theft because the feds got sick of it. Now mm -hmm. it's two years consecutive to whatever else you get. That, mm -hmm. There's other ones where it happens, but not very often. I saw Albert Hatchett, which, you know, a, a, a great attorney uh, who uh, – uh, he, he had a tax case before Judge Zadkoff in federal court, and he essentially he, he was representing himself along with some other attorneys who were also assisting in the defense. And he basically told the judge he was an idiot and the judge did not appreciate that. And I think he got convicted of three misdemeanor tax cases, which the judge gave consecutively. I don't know if that was appealed or how that ended up, but you might know, Steve, or maybe not. Right. I would say that you could leave out the word basically for what Albert told the judge, <laughs> <laughs> which probably in retrospect, although now he's deceased, I'm sure as he was sitting doing his time, he probably thought, eh, sometimes it's better to stand <laughs> mute like we advise our clients. Right, right. All right. Uh, well, there's plenty of stories on the national front beyond the truck driving uh, um, incident. So, uh, Let's go around and uh, see what was the national. And if you want, you can make it the international uh, story of the year. Uh, uh, yeah, me? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, you know, in all honesty, I didn't know that we were going to discuss either of these things, but I certainly didn't. I didn't think that the Omicron or that the COVID stuff would be the local story of the year. It is. And it's the national story of the year to me, too. And a lot of it has to do with what Alexis was saying. I, I, I guess all of us are kind of saying you know, we've never lived through something like this where the, the variety of reactions and the way in which it affects different kinds of individuals, people who have elderly parents, people who have little kids like Alexis. I mean, it's just I, I've never seen anything like this in my lifetime. I didn't live through the Great Depression. I heard about it from my parents. And obviously, I didn't live through the Holocaust. Lengel heard about that from his parents. But th th these kinds of things 
that affect the entire society. The way this is done, to me, that's the national story of the year. I don't disagree. Alan? Um, I agree with Steve. Uh, I think another national story of the year is the January 6th uh, riots, insurrection, whatever you want to call it. I think we, I think it's just so mind-boggling. And what, what's it's not only mind boggling, but it's mind boggling that the Republican Party almost collectively, with a few exceptions, has tried to minimize it, try, you know, done the whole thing of, oh, it was just tourists who were just, you know, touring and that, you know, it was no different. I mean, just trying to minimize it, just insulting to law enforcement, insulting to democracy. Uh, I think it, it undermined our image around the world and we're pushing for democracy and telling other countries, you need to get your shit together. And other countries are like, what are you guys talking about? Have you seen any of the news clips? Uh, you know, the center of our democracy and it's such a symbol. And people say, oh, well, they were, you know, some of the Republicans say, well, they were smashing windows on, uh, on in Manhattan and they were smashing windows in Portland. And, Port you know, I, I have friends in Portland. Portland is screwed up from all the, the protests and stuff like that. And a lot of the protesters, you know, were just anarchists who were just wanted to smash windows. They, they weren't pas so much passionate about the issues as it was just just about anarchy, anti-police. Uh, but I think the capital is just such as we would say back in the old neighborhood, Steve, a Shonda. So. <laughs> that means a disgrace for those yes. people listening. Yes. I've learned so many Yiddish words on this, this, this in the last few minutes. Oh, it gets worse. It's it a Yiddish shower. Dropping them. Sometimes we do the entire show in Yiddish. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I didn't know what they call it in the new neighborhood, so thanks for the clarification there. <laughs> ML. You know, I, I mean, all of these things come together for me. What, what we've seen in this past year uh, is an extension of what we saw in, in 2020 and something that we've been seeing since 2016, but it's now to, to absurdist, potentially apocalyptic levels, people's willingness to only believe what they want to believe, people's willingness and ability to ignore cold, hard facts, whether it's because you absolutely love uh, a Republican or a Democrat because you worship at the altar of guns because you don't want to wear a mask because your guy or your woman won or lost an election. I had somebody, I lost my city council election and I lost it by a significant margin. And I know somebody who's kind of Trumpy and who paid no attention to the race, uh, was not involved in my campaign in any way, contrary to what you may have heard on social media from some of my uh, opponent's supporters. And her reaction after was like, how'd it go? And I said, <laughs> I lost by a lot. And it said, was the election stolen? I said, no, I just lost. She knows <laughs> nothing about this. But her first reaction was because the candidate she wanted to win lost, that something, something must have been rotten uh, in Denmark. And we see this on the right. We see this on the left. We, we're balkanized. We're, we're hiding out enclaves. We won't believe things that go contrary to our wishes, and it's going to kill us. If nothing else kills us, that's going to kill us. Let me tell you something. Guns are dangerous, okay? I know guns are a tool. I know it's a weapon, but there's a lot of tools with these weapons, and they're killing us, and they're killing our kids. And we can all go to Congress and say we need to limit the number of shots in a clip. Well, if this young man in Oxford is proven to be guilty, he didn't go in there with some 10 foot long magazine. He went in there with a gun that we are led to believe shithead Papa bought him for Christmas. Now, I don't know why they didn't wait until Christmas. Might have saved us all a lot of trouble. Sure. But it's time for us to start yeah. recognizing some things and to stop pretending. And, and the reason why the Oxford shooting isn't my national story of the year is because kids being killed by other kids with guns they shouldn't have right. is not a new story. This is just an annual installment. And the NRA has succeeded in grooming us to a point where we're no longer shocked or terrified by these things unless they affect someone we know and love. And here's the sad thing. By the time I die, I got a feeling almost everybody I know is going to know somebody who got hurt or injured through six degrees of separation or otherwise because this is not going away. 
And it's time for people to face some facts because facts might save us. You know, the NRA, there's no organization that's done more to make it easier to get guns. They've fought every step of the way and it made it so easy. And, and, and what you see is also ATF, which is supposed to be enforcing on the federal level our, our gun laws. What they do in Washington is they essentially defund these programs. They defund these agencies and give them less so they can't do they can't enforce the laws. And that's what's happening at every level. We see that at the, even in other level, like the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, when Republicans get in, suddenly there's fewer cases being processed. And we see with ATF, ATF has such a hard time getting enough people. They do gun tracing for local, federal. They do a lot of stuff there and they don't have enough. And there's, it's by design. And the other thing is always, and I've brought this up many times, the, the, the ATF has, has, I think, for the last six years been without a permanent director. And, and that's because the, the nominee has to be approved by the NRA. If the NRA doesn't approve of that person, they get next. And the latest person who was for a, a local person who worked in the Detroit ATF office, he was next because the NRA didn't like him. Alexis, what's your national or international story of the year? Okay, so we already hit on on COVID and the impact, but I think that the uh, demise of Build Back Better is a, the national story of the year to me and one that will go into next year. Because if you look at what Build Back Better was supposed to address, things like quality childcare for families, um, student loans, climate change, things that we are literally dealing with and I believe will be critical to us getting, when, when COVID becomes... God, God willing, when, when we're able to get through this, right, we need to be able to recover. And that legislation had so many different pieces that are going to be, that are so critical to how we bounce back and also ensuring that everyone bounces back. Because right now, inequity has been, I think, pushed to the extreme. And you see how people, big companies have made record profits, the rich are getting richer and not feeling a thing and hanging out in their you know, their, their, their houses in the outside of cities. Meanwhile, people who are the backbone of our country are really taking it so very hard. The government should have delivered for them. And I think that we have some serious questions to ask. My hope is that we can, we can get, get, move it um, forward at, at some point again, but the, there's so many, I just think the impact of this is going to be so terrible. I, I think, you know, our country is so far behind some other countries like in Europe where there's there's better health care, where there's better child care, where there's there's leave for, you know, for pregnancy and all, all that stuff. Uh, we and, and we act as if we're like the most advanced country in the world when we're, we're, we're far behind a lot of the other countries that, that consider life style and decency. So, I mean, I think my, I mean, dovetailing on that, Alan, I think my story of the year is the retraction of America from uh, the international stage. Uh, there was some promise with uh, the Biden administration uh, reinserting ourselves into the uh, Paris uh, Accord. Unfortunately, the COP26 uh, climate talks uh, didn't really show much leadership on climate action. Uh, despite the fact that there is an actual climate change czar now, uh, John Kerry, but also taking a look at the uh, the debacle of uh, our withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, not really necessarily Biden's fault, but um, the continuing legacy of uh, what administrations have inherited, including a, um, an agreement by the Trump administration in Doha, Qatar last year. But also news today about how apparently through some satellite photography, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, our staunch ally in the region, is uh, developing a ballistic missile system uh, funded by, or actually they funded themselves, but developed by China. Uh, so the idea of China now moving into areas that are still supposedly within our spheres of influence uh, shows uh, that the United States uh, no longer has the footprint 
that it once did. And it's going to be really interesting to see um, as we move further in ML's lifetime, not only uh, looking at how many people we know who are affected by uh, gun violence, but also what we're going to see with um, uh, the Earth's axis tilting away from a presumption of American dominance. So uh, stay tuned on that chipper uh, <laughs> item there. Uh, well, with that, we are now moving toward our uh, usual segment in, the, uh, in our episode, which is... And now, it's time for Deadline Detroit's nominees for Schmuck of the Week. Which, of course, we are going to amend uh, today in our year-end uh, episode to be Schmuck of the Year, or in deference to Alexis, uh, Putts of the Year. Thank you. Yeah. It's a lot more polite. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you go first, Alexis, and then we'll go back to Schmuck after you. <laughs> okay. So my putts of the year <laughs> is whoever came up with the messaging around the um, rollout of the vaccines. I think we should have from the very beginning really tempered expectations. And they spent so much time acting like the vaccine was gonna be this, you know, solve everybody's problem and that no one would get sick and it ended up being like where you look at where we are now, you've got so many people are vaccinated, boosted, or still getting COVID. The message should have been the vaccination won't, will, will prevent you from severe, severe illness and prevent from death from the start, right? I think the messaging was never controlled and clear enough. And also the, clear, the understanding that we didn't know everything we needed to know at the time, right? That this was something that was rapidly evolving. And I think there was not enough time in terms of the messaging around how we educated the public and what people understood vaccinations to, to be. Because I think a lot of people who are anti-vaxxers have used the fact that people who are vaccinated and boosted are still getting COVID to explain why they're not getting the vac vaccine and why they're suddenly right and all of that. I think it should have been positioned better and um, more transparently from the beginning. You remember when suddenly the mask mandates went away, a text message came across phones and a news alert saying, cool to take off your mask, as if being vaccinated suddenly made it so that you were just invincible. We weren't. Those kind of steps should have been handled a lot more intentionally and thoughtfully from the very beginning. I think that could have made a, made a difference. OK. All right. Fair enough. Hey, yeah, Alan, sure. and, Alan and Steve, I, I, I want to get a ruling from you or a, a fatwa if you want. If you've got <laughs> schmuck and if you've got putts, could a portmanteau of that be schmutz? <laughs> no, schmutz is like funny, but schmutz, schmutz is a completely different word in Yiddish. Right. <laughs> schmutz I know. Oh, well, yeah. A schmendrick it could be, but not, not, not schmutz. <laughs> okay. Just, just, just checking. Yeah. Steve, would you like to go next? There were so many candidates for schmuck of the year. You, the entire spectrum of Republican politicians. But my schmuck of the year is Mike Lindell. Uh -huh. the, yeah. The guy from my pillow, and I, I did a little bit of looking, you know, maybe five minutes of looking, and I find the following. Uh, Mike Lindell claims he has spent $25 million to pursue all of these false claims all around the country. According to some independent something, his net worth is supposed to be $50 million, right? So supposedly he has spent half of his money to try to prove that China interfered with the election, that Hugo Chavez, even though he's been dead for a X number of years, <laughs> got into the Dominion systems and blah, 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 blah. This is what he was trying to prove for $25 million. The reason I make him the schmuck of the year is let's look at what he's accomplished besides making a complete asshole out of himself. Look what he's accomplished. He lost, according to, again, some kind of record keeping that somebody's doing, $80 million in sales because he was banned from certain sites because of his craziness and his politics. And he also managed, just to show how he was able to make all that dough in the first place, I don't know, his, the lawsuit filed by Dominion against him is for $1.3 billion. So to me, the ability to make a complete asshole out of yourself on television, in the press, and out in public, and you couple that with spending half of your net worth on the same bullshit, and you still manage to lose more money for your company and get sued for $1.3 That is a hell of a 
It's not even a trifecta. It's like a sink factor or something like that. That's pretty tough to do. And for that, you, Mike Lindell, are my schmuck of the year. Okay, ML. So I don't question Lindell's accounting because before he became the my pillow guy, he spent 100% of his income on crack. <laughs> he spent 100% of his income on this bullshit. Couldn't surprise anybody who's been keeping up with current events. That's a classic. But uh, he was also a gambler too, so you know his judgment. Uh, now he didn't lose all his money at Trump's casinos. It was Trump's casinos that lost all of Trump's money. And left all those contractors high and dry, but I digress. Um, my uh, my not particularly clever gentleman of the entire year uh, touches all the bases from conspiracy theories about Russian involvement in elections to stealing of elections to COVID-19 to you name it. And that's Republican Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin. Because remember when I said facts are important? One. Not my facts, not his facts, but the facts. And he lately has been saying that one way to beat the COVID is with mouthwash. <laughs> That's his fact. And there's a scientist facts. But let's go with Listerine, who sell mouthwash and probably wouldn't mind seeing a little run on that, that toxic uh, gargle if this was true. They say, our shit doesn't stop COVID. <laughs> uh, it may kill some funky breath and all your taste buds. But we recommend that you follow CDC guidelines. So, uh, Ron Johnson, there's not one thing in the public domain that you won't be wrong about and proud to be wrong about it. So this year, last year, and probably next year, you're my guy. You know, ML, if uh, Sperry Topsiders and IZOD and everything retro is coming back, then I think we need to make a push for Binaka. You know. <laughs> Let, yes, let's turn, let's turn wow. it too timely. Yeah, there you yeah, go. Yeah, you know, like now here's the, here's the silver lining. A lot of the people who don't want to wear masks also have dragon breath. So if they want to believe that mouthwash will help, it won't help them. But it sure as hell will help those of us who end up getting within six feet of them. Uh, <laughs> definitely true. Alan? I'm going to go with Steve Bannon, who is... Uh, no, nah, he's just an evil, like James Bond character. I mean, the Republican Party just keeps replacing. We had Karl Rove, just evil people plotting all the time. And he is currently plotting again to subvert, you know, democracy. Uh, he was pardoned by Trump after trying to rip off all these people who were trying to support the building of the wall. And stuff like that. I, I just think he is really just you, when you would talk about draining the swamp. I mean, boy, you talk about that guy takes up a lot of gigabytes, megabytes, whatever in the swamp. A little mixing of metaphors there. But uh, <laughs> I think uh, I'm going to have to go with uh, the schmuck of the year uh, who could probably be schmuck of the decade at this point is Fox News's <laughs> very own Tucker Carlson. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The master of mendacity, uh, he is the, uh, the, I wouldn't say he's the pioneer, but certainly the patron. The look of on his face people. alone. Yeah, the face isn't too, uh, too great either. But uh, here is somebody who peddles and traffics in absolute falseness uh, and to the point of uh, ginning up uh, a public that seems to, at least a semi part of the public, that seems hell bent on uh, making January the sixth not just a commemoration but a catalyst for something more. Uh, clearly, there's an economic uh, component to this because his boss uh, Rupert Murdoch just bought a two hundred million dollar ranch in Montana uh, for himself and uh, ex Mick Jagger. Um, I'll call you right back. Uh, uh, baby mama uh, Jerry Hall. So, uh, yeah, Tucker Carlson, you win Schmuck of the Year for me. Uh, so Amen. All, all great schmucks and a, putz, <laughs> and a great putz, too. Isn't, isn't that an oxymoron, that being a great schmuck? <laughs> That's true. That is true. Or to, or to borrow from other people. It feels right here, though, in this moment, though. This, this feels, yeah. feels kind of right. feels appropriate. Or maybe Mahashmuk, you know, I mean, to sort of, you know, borrow from great soul with Mahatma. Well, listen, thank you all for ringing out uh, 2021 and this year in review uh, with us. Uh, Steve Fishman, uh, ML Elric, as always. And thank you also, uh, Alexis Wiley. Uh, for me, Saeed Khan, thank you so much for a wonderful year. 
Uh, here's hoping that 2022 is certainly better than 2021 and certainly better than 2020. And with the outro, as always, happy holidays and drive home safely.